Natural resources, the lifeblood of Canada's economy, pulsating through the veins of our nation, sustaining our prosperity and fueling our ambitions. Yet beneath the surface lies a story of conflict and complexity. In the heart of this vast landscape, small northern towns like Smithers, BC, stand as silent witnesses to the tumultuous dance between industry, government, and environmental advocacy. It's here, amidst the tranquil beauty of nature, the echoes of global conflicts reverberate, casting a shadow over the lives of ordinary citizens caught in the crossfire. Costing nearly $15 billion, the Coastal Gasling Pipeline was completed October 2023. Its purpose? To transport liquefied natural gas, the pinnacle of cleaner fossil fuel technology. Using a transport method with significantly less risk of accidents or spills comparative to rail or truck. Environmental degradation is an undeniable fact, but so is our current dependency on fossil fuels. And yet, despite the pipeline's promise to usher in an era of compromise, what resulted instead throughout its construction was five years of utter political chaos and violence. Breaking down the door. Don't, Don't touch her. Touch Don't. Let, get your hands off her. Uh, two subjects working their way uh, westbound to, to each pile. <laughs> Breaking window! No breaking window! Let go! Oh! Let go! Oh! We're learning new details tonight about an attack on a pipeline construction site in northern BC. Coastal Gas Link is releasing pictures of those it says are responsible, while police are sealing off the area to conduct a criminal investigation. CTV's Binder Sudgeon has the latest. New images released by Coastal Gas Link of mass suspects after what the company calls a coordinated attack on a work site that left nine people shaken. In a statement, the company saying our people were terrorized during this violent incident. On Thursday, just after midnight, the company says night workers fled while about 20 people, some with axes, damaged equipment. The site, 60 kilometers from Houston, and the road, says CGL, was blocked by fallen trees, fires, and tire spikes. This is a crime scene. Friday, RCMP had blocked off access to the site. Damage is estimated in the millions. We're planning at this point for two weeks, but that's very fluid. No arrests have been made. It is reprehensible, and uh, we completely condemn it and those who committed this heinous crime. One officer was injured when responding after Mounties were hit with smoke bombs and sticks lit on fire. This last uh, set of incidents have actually taken it to another level. It is really quite shocking. The case of the CGL attack remains unsolved to this day, at least in the public eye. Because the truth is, the community knows exactly who did this. And here's the kicker, so do the RCMP. But to unravel this mystery, first we must delve into the murky world of politics behind the pipeline wars. The Maurice River Road, a narrow winding logging route etched into the snowy wilderness just outside rural Houston, BC. It traces the path of the coastal gasling pipeline, a vital artery for industry workers, but also a flashpoint for radical protest camps. Traveling this route is an eerie journey where every bend in the road holds a whisper of uncertainty. A trucking radio crackles to life, a lifeline in the wilderness, ensuring safe passage amidst the icy terrain. But with each transmission, one can't help but wonder who else might be listening and what their intentions may be. All right, uh, we have two light vehicles coming up at uh, the 17 kilometer mark, one silver, one black, thank you. Up the road at the 44 kilometer mark, there's a permanent fort set up by radical Antifa style activists protesting the pipeline. One of a few structures across these roads built as an almost military style base against industry in the area. Essentially, the Canadian government has allowed Antifa hippies to turn an entire region of Northern Canada into a militarized zone. 
a permanent Chaz style structure, one we all had to pay millions to assist policing. One of the main reasons for investigating such a camp is the curious mismatch in Canada's treatment towards eco-terrorism versus the peaceful protest of groups such as Canada's trucker convoy. To give you an example of the scale of disruption these extremists have caused, the government spent only 14.1 million policing the trucker convoy. In contrast, the RCMP has spent nearly $50 million policing the LNG pipeline against these activists. The argument by Canada's government for its invocation of the Emergencies Act was a supposed threat to Canada's economic sovereignty. Yet for some reason in this case, a protest which has established permanent militant presence, is committing violence and actively disrupting industry, this resulted in no emergency policies, no bank accounts frozen, nor GoFundMes shut down. The bias could not be more obvious. Winding down these roads, it wasn't long before we ran into activists from the Gittendam camp heading toward town to stock up on goods, who maintain their post despite completion of the pipeline, bringing into question their intentions for the future. Interesting. With the Gittendam camp, that's the protesters, right? That is very interesting. Not what's Odin. That was strange, yeah. yeah. Well, the first thing they said to us is, do we have permission to be here? It's very interesting um, having a white guy look at us and say, do you have permission to be on this exactly. land? <laughs> exactly, and we're with a Wet'suwet'en uh, elder. Yeah, that shut him up real quick when we mentioned that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. I guess they do have people working at the camps right now. They do, yeah. But we'll have to go up like and check it out. Packing up too. Yeah, Might be. No, you said they're going into town. Going into they're, town probably to get, to get groceries. To go get some uh, Cheetos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we'll keep going and see if. Yeah, let's go explore. Although, I bet they're radioing camp to let them know. Oh, probably. Intruders. I bet there's actually a wet soda in coming. <laughs> be on your best behavior. Yeah. The protesters wanted to know if we had permission to be on the land by the local indigenous community, the Wet'suwet'en or Gittendem nations, peoples at the heart of this controversy, given this land is their traditional territory. We were lucky enough to have Shirley Wilson, an elder of the Wet'suwet'en nation, as our guide. She tells me in their language they call this place Yinta. It is a deeply cherished and spiritual location for her and her people. However, despite what the media and protesters have portrayed the situation as, loving this land does not necessarily mean opposing all industry. If you speak to the community, they will tell you the indigenous peoples here are hardly a monolith against the pipeline. If anything, it's the protesters who are often unknown non-locals that wreak havoc in using and co-opting the identity of the traditional groups here. In some cases, quite literally stealing traditional names that do not belong to them. In fact, December 7, 2021, the National Post released a statement authored by members of the Gittendam clan and released by Wet'suwet'en First Nation Council, stating, Our concerns are not about the pipeline itself. Some of us support it, some of us do not, and some of us are neutral. Our issue is that our traditions and way of life are being misrepresented and dishonored by a small group of protesters, many of whom are neither Gittendam nor Wet'suwet'en but nonetheless claim to be acting in our name to protest natural gas development. The deep history of this community is hardly something I would feel comfortable explaining myself, but as an elder, Shirley has wisdom outside what any journalist could ever understand. Do you feel the story was told properly by um, the media? No, not at all. There was just, it seemed like it was pretty biased or one-sided. Uh, they never heard our side of the story. Um, at all uh like i don't even know you know which media some of them they i never even heard of them before i know of the mainstream ones like cbc or ctv or something like that they're always right out there and they gave their version and whatever but it was always just a fast story to just draw their you know their followers are that but these other people that came in from timbuktu and everywhere else um um, they just were, it seemed like they, they had a plan already in the back of their heads or whatever that they, they wanted to be biased or one-sided. 
and only listen to one version without coming to the other side and saying, okay, this is a story from this side, let's get your side. Or if they did, it was just a little bit, a little clip here or there to satisfy their, you know, their their video clip or whatever. And I, I just, uh, I don't know, it was all um, carefully censored or carefully, you know, to the tune to what they wanted. And, and we were never happy about it all along. And um, it really um, hurt our community. Our leaders didn't like it. And it was very difficult to, you know, maneuver through that, even though it was just words a lot of the time. But words can hurt just as much as the physical attack. And uh, it can stay with you f for a long time. Shirley has reaped the whirlwind of slander and misrepresentation, although she's always come from a place of wanting to be a peacemaker. Initially, Shirley was dead set in opposition to the pipeline. Being a mother and seeing the crushing weight of poverty and need for opportunity in her community, she warmed up and instead began to assist CGL in monitoring construction, ensuring both the environment and cultural standards were protected in the process. I'm here in support of industry whether it's forestry, logging, mining, and right now, pipeline. Our nation, for example, has worked with, you know, in the consultation process a number of years before even the shovel was in the ground. It wasn't just an overnight, this was carried on a number of years. And um, after getting educated about, you know, what benefits there would be for our people, and you know those interested we thought yeah and then our leaders went for it and through consultation meetings and meetings with our nation and our elders we decided yes it's good for us. Shirley isn't just an advocate for industry and opportunity though. Her family have lived here for generations. They still hunt, farm and practice many of their traditions. She makes herbal medicine, smokes her own meats, truly lives off the land. We spent much time discussing her love of food and family. Care, I want to just eat anything, and then I went to my friend's place and dropped in, the, and she had moose tongue boiling in her moose hand. Tongue. So I ate some moose tongue for supper. Is moose tongue good? <laughs> yes, it's just beautiful. It's a, one of the most <laughs> most delicate, best. Like white man loves her, or what do you call it, caviar? Okay, <laughs> that's like our Indian caviar. No way. Moose tongue, moose nose, even moose nose. Mm -hmm. After spending our day seeing Shirley's lovely soul full of laughter and wisdom, it's hard to imagine all the division that has occurred around her, and more so how the media have given so little airtime to elders like Shirley. In fact, around 25% of Coastal GasLink's current workforce are Indigenous, including Wet'suwet'en Nation members. Those who have been contracted like Shirley or other elders like Bonnie George are deeply involved in the project specifically because they care for preserving their traditional lands and will be involved in the reclamation process, the process of replanting local trees and plants and environmental factors that may have been removed in the process of building. The public perception of Indigenous opposition to industry in Smithers, Kitimat, Houston and the surrounding northern areas often comes from a small group of unelected, rather bizarre characters and activists, getting countless blank checks from organizations around the world to astroturf a movement that otherwise would not exist within the current community. Given the support of industry among the local population who need it to survive, unlikely coalitions of friends formed. Wet'suwet'en members, workers, and non-Indigenous locals like Dave Johnson formed North Matters. Everybody gets along. Everybody, uh, everybody's kids play hockey together. Uh, there's never any arguments, never any fights, unless it's acting. And that's really what this pipeline protest has been. It's uh, been a show, like it's been an acting show that has no ties to the communities. It's its own entity. Uh, we don't see it, hear about it. Um, there's no bad relationship. I mean, we have all races that live and work and play in the North. And I, for myself, I've never seen any form of racism. In fact, it's quite opposite. 
What was pretty clear from talking to Dave and everybody else in the community was that the vast majority of people present at these protests, day in and day out, are not from the area. Hell, some of them are not even from Canada. So nobody really understands to the full extent who these people are because there's so many people from all over the world that are going there. Um, they don't like to talk about who they are. They wear masks, they wear jumpsuits. They kind of try to tell everybody that's out on that territory what to do, like as if they own that, that area. But from what we've seen in our research, the majority aren't even from the region, the province, the country, and in some cases, uh, the continent. Uh, we found a lot of people from Australia, um, England, like kind of all over the world. We all know um, with the North Matters, we did a lot of research into um, the different players that were involved in this. A lot of career protesters, um, people that go from pro protest to protest. Uh, a lot of them were at the Ferry Creek protest down on the island and it's their way of living that's how they make a living going from protest to protest uh, they don't really know anything about it they don't really know any of the locals they just see where they can make money and they and they follow the dollars um, they don't care who they hurt they don't care who's in their way we're asking you to get out. We need to shut down camp. They've told us that it's the only thing that has gotten them any results. When we do follow the dollars, one name crops up again and again. Molly Wickham, also known as Slado. She is one of the local activists who have been identified and arrested as part of the protests as a community leader. It is Wickham who has been in the receipt of hundreds of thousands of dollars from GoFundMes and other donations and grants. And Molly, according to the people we've interviewed, isn't a fan of protesting peacefully. But in this case, it was, from what I understand, it was Molly and those protesters that invited these people into the territory that brought this violence, and they knew that that was coming. That was a part of the tactic of where this protest was going and what it was meant to achieve, which was to completely shut down the project. Um, now, when it started turning that way, um, I understand that uh, her husband said that she needed to stop and they needed to get out of it, um, but she would made a decision that she would rather do that than be with her husband and father of her children. And so he left, left her and she stayed doing this, uh, part being part of this protest with these people that brought this violence. And, uh, that makes me almost feel like it's, it became like a cult, like a, it was almost like this cult that just brought people in and it was all about destruction. Raising money, little and often, from sympathetic sources across the world is a common tactic for anarchist protesters. Giving a few dollars here and there can add up and fund people for months and even years. But not on this scale. What we're seeing here is a far more sophisticated funding trail. I've spent a lot of time researching, like, why is that? What's going on here? Is this an industry? Like, is this an actual industry now? Um, trying to shut down opportunities for families. And everything points to, yes, it is. I mean, there's a lot of money being pumped into it. And it's being pumped in by these ENGOs, environmental non-governmental organizations. And the likes of Sierra Club, Dogwood Foundation, a um, lot of the original funding comes from Tides Canada. Um, originally Tides Foundation out of the U.S. Uh, it all funnels through different organizations until it ends up here and it goes into the pockets of, of protesters that are coming to shut down opportunities for these communities. 
Just so everyone understands, the Tides Foundation is a liberal dark money group designed to allow leftist billionaires to give money to liberal causes without the money being traceable to them. One of its major funders is George Soros. And here's the thing. Tides doesn't even bother tracking how its money is used. Whether it's used to print flyers advertising environmentalist causes to school children or to militarize an entire region of northern Canada, they don't really care so long as there is a cause to be served, which means that every group who wants funding from them has an incentive to manufacture causes to fight about, just to keep their lights on with grants. These ENGOs, like Tides, are part of an extremely well-put-together network that's able to hide and obfuscate exactly where money comes from and where it eventually goes to. As one example... If you go back many years, um blockades to all pipelines, east and west, uh, spawned from an organization in the U.S. called Corp Ethics. And in their mantra, their doctrine uh, that they originally wrote, uh, it was an originally called the Tar Sands Campaign. And what they wrote the purpose of that campaign was, was to landlock Canadian oil so that it can't reach international market to fetch a higher price. So from that, you really need to look at like, who, who are those people and who is funding them? There's a lot of interest in the US, big money interests um, with getting our oil at a discounted price because we can't ship it anywhere else. Um, along with all of our other resources, because you have rail lines that go down into the US and those rail lines are, are owned by big money down in the U.S. that don't want to see that product being shipped overseas either. Um, so in my opinion, uh, those would be the reasons why this money is being funneled through these environmental organizations to shut down these projects so that these corporations and billionaires in the U.S. don't lose out on, on the huge money that they're profiting off of our resources. In other words, when you follow the money, it tells a very different story from the PR statements and media party line. That these protests are being subsidized not in the name of protecting the environment, but for a completely self-serving reason. Because the United States billionaire class wants to keep energy prices down in the United States. And the only way to do that is to prevent Canadian oil from being sold internationally. In other words, even if the protesters are sincere in their environmentalist convictions, the only reason they're able to protest at all is because they're useful tools for foreign interests. Interests who profit from cheap Canadian oil. Somehow I doubt that these protesters would be comfortable being stooges for the Exxon Mobiles and BPs of the world, but hey, no one said selling out is easy. However, here in Canada, all this foreign influence has wreaked havoc on the local community for decades, and any blue-collar workers involved understand the real-world consequences of this better than anyone. Rick has been a logger in the Smithers region for much of his life, and he has witnessed the many phases of industry and protest. What are your thoughts on eco-terrorism? Is it a problem in Canada? Absolutely it is. Absolutely. It's a, it's a problem right in this valley. You know, I, again, being... Uh, three decades in the logging industry, you know, I, I lived through the Clackwood Sound protests where they were literally spiking trees and undermining roads and sabotaging equipment trying to kill loggers. Uh, so I've seen that. I lived through it and uh, it's it's the same thing happening here now and with a lot of the same people to be frank. Could you tell us about some of the recent attacks that have happened uh, or based around the pipeline? Yeah, well, they've, so there's been a few, like they've had uh, you know, of course, the ones everybody know about when they when they went out and uh, you know vandalized equipment and and threatened the the, the operators. Like, I actually threatened them with death. A few of them, you know, and were trying to set their equipment on fire while they were in them and burning their camps and things like that. Uh, th and there was also the more subtle things where they were undercutting trees uh, on the way out to the work site with the with the I guess what they wanted to see happen was the wind blows down on somebody that's maybe standing outside or one of their pieces of equipment or something. Um, and just, you know, there's been probably a dozen real uh, bad incidents. You know, we had one right in Smithers where they said a bunch of uh, 
pipeline vehicles on fire right outside a, a fully booked hotel, you know, right in the middle of town. And I, I shudder to think what would have happened if, you know, the fire would have spread to that hotel or to some of the surrounding businesses, you know, it, you know there was, there was ambulances, an ambulance crew staying at the hotel at the same time and it burned up ambulance. Like it's, you know, it, it just really terrible things. And we were just lucky that nobody's been killed. Are the government doing much about this? That sounds pretty serious. They are the government now. You know, like I said, there's, there's Faith and Cullen and, 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 uh, and Taylor Bacharach who are right from these groups who have, who have themselves directly involved or if, if not, you know, uh, involved philosophically in our governance now. And they, they sit on every council, they sit on every, every resource board. And it's not just them. There's, there's a whole bunch of them, you know, that sort of started showing up around the same time that are here now. And, and, and like I said, they're organized and, and now they're in, they're affecting our governance now. It's very strange for me to hear about these things, you know, literal vehicles being set on fire, people being attacked, threatened in such extreme ways, industry being held up. Yeah. Uh, when we just recently had the trucker protests where our government invoked the Emergencies Act based on our economic sovereignty being a threat. This sounds like more than just, well, as well as economic sovereignty, people's lives being a threat, but there has been no Emergencies Act and there have been no arrests from what I understand. Well, it's true. You know, our former MLA, uh, NDP MLA, you know, he was out bringing uh, care packages to people who were, you know, who, who had rifles and were threatening to, to shoot people and, and everything else, you know. And, and it's a, that's been a prevailing conversation that I have with lots of people. It's like, why was, the, why was the hammer brought down so hard for people just wanting to exercise, you know, body autonomy and, 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 and not for people that are actually physically trying to destroy infrastructure and, and hurt people. It just, it doesn't seem right for a lot of people. And I think a lot of people are getting a little braver and, and speaking up about it. But yeah, we all wonder where, where are the arrests? Where's, where's the, uh, the, the accountability? Perhaps one of the most shocking things we've heard from people is in the major attack that they are still actively investigating, allegedly on the CGL pipeline where all the equipment was destroyed and people were attacked with axes. We have had individuals in this community give us names of people involved in that attack and that have told us these are the names we have told the RCMP and they will not act. Do you think there's some sort of conspiracy here? Well, I, you know, I don't know if it's so much a conspiracy. I, I just think, you know, I think there's been a real, uh, what's the word I want to use here? Like a, a you know, with the with the, with the prevailing wisdom of of our provincial government is that they don't want to get themselves involved in this uh, on a government level, right? They were used to being in opposition and just opposing everything. So now this is something that's that's actually happening, and they hate it. So I think they're going to do whatever they can to to make sure that these people aren't held accountable for their actions, because a lot of them are them. You know, it's uh, it's people that they associate with. It's people that they, you know, sit at the brewery and have beer with. It's, you know, it's it. They are, they are their people. And it's it's interesting though. Just as a side to that, you know, I've I've I've, I've worked around and, and seen you know these buses of of activists heading out to the to pipeline protests and you know and I don't know what the numbers were uh, towards the end when it got really big. But these were buses coming out from Ontario, Quebec, and, and things like that. So there wasn't a whole lot of local people out there when this first started, you know. And, I, and, and to this day, I don't think the majority of people that have been out there have been from not in the valley. And, you know, and have ties to some kind of group or are being paid to do it. While Rick and many others in the local community are well aware of the details of these attacks on their industry, what may not be as commonly known by the Canadian public is how sophisticated the CGL pipeline attack of 2022 really was. They didn't just attack the equipment and workers. They had decoy attacks and roadblocks set up at different locations to distract police and other security personnel. And we were able to obtain an interview for the first time with one of the local workers who was held hostage at the decoy site. A sand truck driver who has requested we call him Sam. I'm a resident of Houston most of my life. 
driving truck for 30 years. Now I drive a sound truck on the Morris River Road. The Morris River Road, what's going on there? What's been happening there the last 10 years, essentially, I guess? Pipeline has come in. The roads have gotten extremely busy, extremely dangerous in my opinion. And then uh, there was a uh, blockade on the 17th of February, 22. And I was stuck behind it for six hours. I was, uh, I, w I got pumped up, excited, anxious, I don't know what, because when I got home and I watched the news, everything I had watched on the news about the Martin Road was all news to me. Mm -hmm. I didn't know nothing about what happened on the Mar Martin Road until I seen it on the news. Mm -hmm. I only seen what happened at 40 and a quarter. Mm -hmm. And what they did is had a big flag across the road and bomb fires and people dropping trees. And, and uh, two people had walked up to me and that's when they, because I was too close to that flag. So they walked up to me and said, you need to back up. So they backed me up about 300 meters because they said they were dropping trees. And I said, I don't work for the pipeline, I work for Canfor. I need to get these roads sanded. You know, I do, I do it even for your safety. Nope, we're about dropping trees, it's unsafe, back up. Who were the people dropping the trees? They were anti-pipeline protesters. Uh, yeah, but I have no idea who they were because they were all dressed in black suits. So they were almost acting like a militant group yes. just took over the area. That's right. And demanding you position yourself differently, just completely. Yeah. So they were essentially holding you hostage there. Yeah, essentially holding me hostage. You might say that. Yeah, it was, uh, it was only minus six that evening. It was moonlight, so I shut my truck off, listening, and I could hear power saws. I couldn't hear nothing else. I couldn't see. I could see the river down here. I could see everywhere. So there was nobody walking around me, behind me, nothing. <laughs> Were you a bit worried being around all these masked folk with power saws? <laughs> you might say I was a little bit worried, but I was also in a great big Peterbilt truck. Mm -hmm. So when the, when the RCMP did show up at about seven o'clock in the morning, they, they didn't even know I was there. Mm -hmm. So I jumped out of the truck and I was talking to Mark Smale. He's a, he was a sergeant in town. He didn't even know I was there. And I said, yeah, I've been stuck here since like 1.30 or 1 o'clock this morning. Been stuck here and haven't been able to go. He said, well, they got the road open enough enough for pickup. And I looked at him, I said, watch me, I'm going through there. <laughs> pickup or no pickup, I'm going through it. So I went through, they just chopped a, a lane wide enough for a pickup. But I went through there with my sound truck because I had serious determination. I think, my personal opinion. Um, I just think that uh, things could have been uh, worked out instead of uh, escalating the way they did to the to the point of scaring people or possibly hurting people or damaging equipment. Yeah. It seems uh, it, okay. So there's been no, no there's been no arrests of the people who committed these attacks on the Maurice Road and Martin's Road. As far as I was, as far as I know, they they haven't been found. The RCMP, like when they come up at 40 and a quarter and open the road for me, they said there was nobody there. I'm like, how can nobody be there? They were there. They blockaded me. I got pictures here to prove it. Where'd so they, they go? <laughs> and those people come back and they, did they not launch a, did the police launch an investigation where they spent, you know, a decent amount of time looking into it and they, going and questioning people at I 44? presume that they did because after that there was at least a hundred RCMP out there. Okay. A lot of them. Everywhere. All day, every, everywhere there was RCMP. Even at security points such as right at 44 to have RCMP sit there, 63 and a quarter, up at 71 at the Shea Road. Uh, RCMP everywhere out there. At least a hundred RCMP and not a single person arrested for this. That's right. That seems almost implausible. <laughs> Here's another one for you. When I was sitting there in my Lausanne truck at 40 and a half, 41, whatever it was, and I finally seen the RCMP walk, there were a bunch of them walking up, followed by police vehicles. I was never ha so happy to see the RCMP. <laughs> so why didn't they interview me on the spot? Why didn't they look in the back of my sand truck? Maybe I had protesters in the back of it. But they didn't even interview me. They didn't look at my sound truck or nothing. I went home. That's still no, did they interview you later? 
La last summer, this past summer, I was running water truck, same truck, different, different trailer. Okay. Running a water truck. I followed the RCMP up the crystal road. I went to the five and a half to pick up my tank of water. I came back down working on my water truck. And these two RCMP out of Vancouver pulled up to talk to me. And they said, well, you know, they asked me some questions and I told them, I said, yeah, I was the sand truck driver that was blockaded there. So then they questioned me. So I went, well, better late than never, right? What I mean, was it's... it a year later or how, how long? Yeah, a year and a half. A year and a half later, they finally, the police finally questioned you. Yes. And did you find the questions very good? <laughs> I suppose. I, yeah, I, well, not really a year and a half later. <laughs> You're not gonna get like it. I, I told him, I said, better late than never, but I'll tell you what I can. You know, mm -hmm. simple as that. Can't tell you what I don't know. Wow. Yeah, a year and a half later. Wow. Yeah, why didn't I get interviewed on the spot? Do you think we will see anything, any more attacks from these nameless, faceless protesters or groups in the future? Yeah, I think there's a good chance of it. I can't say no, I can't say yes, but it happened once, it'll happen again, hmm. I would think. Do you think the police or media in general, the government will respond differently next time given this previous event? I would think they would. Hmm. I would think so, I would hope so. And uh, anybody involved, anybody even such as myself, should have gotten interviewed on the spot. Right there, right then. Somebody should have looked in the back of my truck. Could have been 10, 15 protesters back there. I guarantee there wasn't. <laughs> but I'm just saying, why didn't they interview me then? Why a year and a half later? That's a good question. It's a damn good question. Yeah. So back to the what I said way in the beginning, I think it's a setup. The most shocking part of Sam's story is how poorly the RCMP conducted their investigation how little effort they put into finding the culprits. The RCMP did not question Sam for over a year after the incident, an incident that cost CGL millions, threatened lives in an act of terror, and has resulted in Canadian taxpayers paying upwards of 50 million in security fees over the years. To reiterate, the average taxpayer has paid more to defend this pipeline than they ever did for the trucker convoy. Which is exactly why this topic is so important. How were the Canadian government able to, and why did the Canadian government bring in the Emergencies Act on the basis of economic sovereignty for the peaceful truckers, but have allowed lifeblood industry in this country to go on being violently attacked for years with little to no investigation and follow-up? Why is peaceful protest being treated more harshly by the hand of the Canadian government than violent terrorism? But what I found was a little preposterous, in my opinion, is nobody was charged, nobody was caught. Um, there's some big question marks around that for me, uh, because if that kind of activity, which we don't see on a regular basis, is happening in the area that we live and work and our families are, how is nothing being done about that? I'd I really don't understand how there can be so many uh, RCMP on top of things out there uh, because of the previous acts of lawlessness um, in the area. And they were there monitoring. They had a regular station set up out there at that time. And I, to not know who did that when you know who did it, everyone does. There's only one group out there that's opposing this. Everybody else supports it. The 21st Nation elected councils up and down the pipeline all supported it. Uh, all the communities support it. All the mayors, all the MLAs, everybody supported it except for this one small group of people out there. How was nothing done about that? Why is industry that keeps these northern towns alive so forgotten? What do you think this town would look like if the pipeline was never built? 
I think would be on the verge of uh, becoming a ghost town. Hmm. If you had one message for our leaders, Justin Trudeau, the liberals, what would it be? Jeez, I need to think about that <laughs> for a minute. There's, I've got I've got about a hundred. I've days. got a hundred. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, there again, I don't think there's anybody that's more out of touch in this country with with what keeps the wheels of our economy going than than him and and his party. You know, but and Trudeau and Trudeau, yeah. You know, and and there's there's it's no coincidence that he's he's sided up with. Jagmeet Singh and the and the NDP because they're just a little bit below him in that in that regard. So you know, I I think I I don't know if there's anything you can say. I think that they they are so entrenched in that ideology that no matter what you show them, no matter how you show them how things can be done well, you know, this is Canada. We're not, you know. There's nobody that does these things better than Canadians do, and we never get credit for that. But you're never going to convince them of that. But as usual, um, the culprits, you know, they camouflage themselves so well or did such a, a sudden attack or whatever that it was hard to determine who or how many or whatever have done all these horrible things to damage property. And... It really sent a negative energy or a negative message to the workers, you know, like um, we didn't feel safe at times because we felt like, well, when are, if they do this to, you know, to property, you know, they're going to start attacking people. Mm -hmm. And we were always on guard and wondering, you know, hoping that we be always safe, you know, not to be caught up in any of this. and. It's just something that we lived with the expectation there was always going to be something wrong going on, you know, whether it was damaging equipment and property or whatever. And um, it created a lot of uncertainty in our, especially in the safety of everyone. You know, like everyone has a right to live and live life to work and feed our families or what have you. And um, it just seemed like... Um, we were treated as criminals just because we chose the work. And I know there was a lot of um, adversity towards us, to some of us that worked on the pipeline. And at first it used to really bother me, but uh, after a couple of years it just sort of floated over me. I didn't really worry about it too much. Things said about me or whatever. I just thought, well, in the end, God knows the truth, and I'm not going to worry about it. Community members like Shirley were slandered, people's jobs put on the line, their safety threatened, a national industry project delayed years and millions of dollars spent on policing. Yet the most that has happened as a result of this is a few court cases against protesters for criminal contempt, resulting in three protesters getting $500 fines and 25 hours community service for two others. In contrast, there are still individuals from the trucker protest who remain behind bars to this day. Reliable sources who were involved in the community and various aspects of the pipeline project have given us names of protesters that partook in the violent attacks against CGL. Names they have also given the RCMP. Given this information, we contacted the RCMP for a statement as to why nothing has been done. Their response? that they could not provide any details due to privacy reasons and had no update on this investigation since December 12, 2022, but claim the file is still very much active and ongoing and that they simply cannot make arrests without solid evidence. It has now been two years without an update on the case. There is a war on Canadians and Canadian industry from both outside and within, from our own governments and foreign ones. And these Canadians, Indigenous or otherwise, inhabiting the North have fought with great honour and won for now. The CGL pipeline was completed last year. There will still be much controversy and attack, no doubt, in the future. 
the local communities stand strong and undivided in their love and support for one another, despite the slings and arrows of media lives.